Story continued from Thaddeus and Tarquinus Playlist. The man before me is small and starved and bedraggled. His wide eyes are ringed with a grey corona of discoloured skin. They are bloodshot and near constantly blinking. He has not slept in many days. Not well, at the very least. His hands shake as he reaches for the water I demand he drinks. Well, my eyes went to the cup, and I then frowned at him. It was enough. All he knows is that I am an inquisitor, and that he is in danger. He is not wrong in this assertion. Of course he is. They all are. As a survivor of a dead world, a place taken by the forces of darkness, they all know that I am an immense threat to them. My one word could doom them all. He raises the cup to his lips and sips. When he is convinced that it is indeed water, he opens his mouth wide and guzzles it back. I have had them all look at me thus, as if I would need to poison them. But the fatigued mind sees enemies everywhere, sees evil around every corner, or sitting across from them, of course. After he drains the drink, he puts a cup back on the table between us with expert care. He looks sheepish, guilty. But I know. This is because he thinks the water was precious. That he should have restrained himself. There will be no more water brought in. And we both know that. Not until we have concluded this discourse. Yet, in the simple act of consuming, he has already passed a test. The water was blessed by an abbess. It is holy. Yet he does not show any outward signs of discomfort. I look at the cuffs he wears. The ones I put on him the second he walks through the door. He sits in a way that the connecting bangles are on his clothes. I look deeply into his eyes as I reach forward and place my hands on his. I do not need to exert much force as I calmly push his hands down his palms now flat on the table. You will not move from this position. Do you understand? He nods. Yet the metal cuffs now touch his wrists as intended. There is no sizzle, no discomfort in him again, no pain. And those cuffs are laced with silver and a dozen other elements or anathema to the tainted. He passes another test. And so, we talk. I've put him on his guard, but now, over the next five minutes, I get him to lower his defenses. I speak of things only we would know about. The pageants, the fairs, the hardships, the customs. For we share something in common. Something that only he and I and the rest of the refugees on the ship can for we come from the same world, the same planet, a land taken by the Dark Ones, by chaos. And by the end of the stint, I almost have him laughing, almost. Yet whenever he beams at a memory of a better time, a home, he looks at me and the light dies from his eyes. My countenance reminds him of his peril. Not my expression, for that is wide and expansive. Eye contact regular, and often a smile on my face. Yet as soon as his vision darts to my armor, to my sigil, he quietens again. The duality of it all confuses him, as I want him to be. Confused. Unguarded. But he sings the same song as all of the others, a ship scheduled to leave the plant on that day. 
the moment brought forward due to the horrors they saw, the skies full of fire and things of the pit, of the warp. Their ship took off with a few others, but those vessels did not make orbit, as they were torn out of the skies by the demons. Only this ship escaped, and one small one before that. But I know the smaller craft, as that is how my master and I left the world ourselves. Master? <sighs> Sad is. He is no longer my master. Yet in this situation, it does not feel it. For he and the elder Farsia watch me as I work. A special room is this. Surreptitious glyphs mark its walls, and it has an entire side which appears as mirror. Yet on the other side, in the room next to us, both Thaddeus and the Elder can see through it. Both can watch. They do not watch the questioned, but the questioner. They are judging me. This is my test. Concluding my initial interrogation of this misbegotten soul, I put an icon of the Emperor before him. He smiles. His eyes glaze over in the usual manner when one sees an image of their God. Yes, this man is a believer. Hence, I do not even bother to instruct him to spit on it, to see him balk or act offended. He is, as far as I can tell, genuine. If he is a servant of darkness, even he does not know it. He was the last. I raise and unchain him from his manacles. I walk to the door and open it and gesture for him to leave. A huge exhale over three seconds is his response. He is nervous, as he should be. But this is not a sign of anything but survivor's guilt. During our conversation, it practically dripped off every sentence, every sentiment. Like so many of them, he questions why he was permitted to live when so many died. He holds this within himself as a talisman of shame. Redundant. But I do not wish to reveal too much. I actually thank him as he leaves. For his honesty. He looks at me dumbfounded as he walks through the door and out to the waiting Devrin and his colleagues. They take the man back to the pens we have prepared. I do not like to see them this way, in the pens, for they are no different to me. We share so much. The joys of the spring, the Emperor's ascension, the harvest ceremonies, the rites of oneness when two were joined for all time in the eyes of the Emperor, the raucous celebrations after, the bubbling brooks and tranquil waterfalls, the expansive fields of crops, all arranged so as to be visually pleasing as well as utterly efficient. Some say that one cannot have both utility and beauty. Our people did not hold to this. And our world was, most certainly compared to most others I have visited, a near-perfect idyll. Never the grandeur or organization of that which I witnessed in Ultramar, on Mighty McCrag. But then, nowhere in the universe can compare to McCrag. <laughs> I check myself. Terror. Holy terror must surely outclass even the home of the Primarch. Yet I do not think I will ever see that place. Just a feeling I have. But then, for one such as I, feelings are not to be ignored. For I am now mighty. Or at the least, I will be, if I can pass this test. The first round of interviews concluded. I have taken the last ten days working through them all, near two hundred. Before, I would have been mentally, spiritually, and emotionally exhausted by the constant game of subtle maneuvers. But not now. I am a man in the midst of carrying out his calling, 
his vocation. I could not say that I enjoy the experience, but equally, I could not say I despised it either. It simply was. A part of my role I will perform to my best, as always. Because so much rests on how I perform. The fate of our line sat squarely on my shoulders. If I fail here, the line and my life will end. Of this I know. Yet I will not act any differently. I will not be heavy-handed or gauche. If I am to die, I shall do so as myself, stood looking at death dead on. I will not hurry or dawdle. I will be now, as I would be in the future. For only then can I pass or fail honestly. In other words, I follow my training to the letter. And I have been trained well. Thaddeus has seen to that. And so, I collect my icons of water, cup and manacles. I walk to the door behind me and enter the room to give my initial report. And there they are. Both Thaddeus and the Eldar sit stoically and static. They give nothing away whatsoever, as I now bow my head to them both and sit across from them. The glass behind me, the two of them blank-faced. Report! State Stadius. I have questioned each and every person on the ship, from highest to lowest. Cut to the chase. I nod in acquiescence. Each of these people have no knowledge of their taint, should they have one. Yet there are inaccuracies in their auras. None have shown any outright aversion to either holy water materials or concepts. Their tales all merge to form a picture. All nuances or discrepancies can be placed at the feet of tension, strain, fatigue, or stupidity. They could not understand what they witnessed, so their tales vary due to this only. The elder's eyebrow raises as he sticks me again with his piercing cold eyes. A tiny sign. A blatant one from such as he. Yet... Deep within their psyche, some of them have dark traits, a fingerprint of potential taint. You garnered all of this from the questions alone? Says Thaddeus. No, I have been surface scanning as I questioned them. Using my telepathic abilities blatantly was not appropriate. Yet in the presence of some of them, I can sense a shadow of a whisper. So, your judgment... Oh, I am far from a judgment, Thaddeus. Then how will you proceed now? I'm going to break this down to the three most likely circumstances, and I shall be blunt. It saves time. One, the entity is jumping from host to host, always a step ahead of me, and by extension, you also, as I have asked for candid advice when necessary. Yet I know you will not inform me of your suspicions. It would by rights negate this test. Thus, the traits I detect are its influence lingering, where it has vacated a body I am about to interrogate. It is intelligent. Option 2. There is no entity. There is no taint. It has all been a fabrication. A slight tweaking of the auras, so they mimic corruption. Nothing a Farsi of the Elder could not do. Is a test perhaps that of control, and to see if my zeal blinds me to the innocent if I am merely informed that an enemy is present. Perhaps this is all a fraud. Option 3. The being is subtle and powerful, and it is of a form and function I have never encountered in book tuition or personal training from you, Thaddeus. The Farseer slowly looked at Thaddeus. Do all Monke students speak thus to their teacher? Or is the child merely rebelling as it does not like the content of our measuring? Neither, said Thaddeus. 
Tarquinus is astute and on the nose here. If he had deployed flattery or dainty mincing of words, then I would know he was being petulant. Standing right here, gents. Oh, stop whining, boy, and get on with your analysis. What's your next step, then? Huh. Well, for brevity, I shall outline the top three responses only. One, put them all back on the ship and blow it to pieces, or aim it at the local star. Expunge them. Two, return them to their ship, but escort them to the nearest unimportant and uninhabited planet. Then put them on it and place a marker for them to never be approached. Three, continue the investigation in a more diligent, more costly way, both in time, effort, and unfortunately, their headcount. But before Thaddeus could even open his mouth, I swept on. The second option is to defray the scenario. It resolves nothing and potentially endangers the larger Imperium if they do carry taint. If it is passed on from one generation to the next, they could eventually be a real threat to all of the systems around them. The first option is lazy and again resolves nothing. It teaches us nothing. For my master once told me, Better to know what the enemy is up to than to merely destroy it. For in the knowing, one can predict their actions, defeat them again and again from the one victory. It is what I have been told we of the traditions must do. The third option is the one I will take first. For my interest is piqued, not just by their origin, for that is merely an emotional and sentimental reaction. This conundrum, I believe, is the challenge, but it will be costly, both to them and to me. In time and in energy, as I have stated, but potentially even sanity, for the only way to gain further information is to use skills I am not truly experienced in. I will actively scan them, peel back the folds of their minds, and smash down their walls, hiding their deepest shames. And there, if it exists, I will find the cause of the taint. This has its cost. The weak minds may be shattered. Even a skilled telepath knows they risk all when delving into another's mind in this way. I can do it. She trained me how. But it was always meant as a last resort, not a primary method. Being inexperienced, I will be clumsy, no matter how I try. Many minds may burn at my touch. I will require one full day to rest and recuperate and prepare myself for this course of action. Should it have your approval, of course. Thaddeus looked at the elder, who gave no outward motion of approval, agreement or negativity. Thus did Thaddeus turn back to me and nod. You will proceed with this plan in exactly 24 hours. And at that, he and the Elder stood as one and walked from the room. As they leave, my shoulders sag. I am not ready for this. Not really. And I am definitely not ready for the repercussions of this. But ready or not, I must do this. I must. Otherwise, well, the solitaire is here. Barbon, Devrin and his crew. There are no lack of cold-blooded killers on this ship. If I do not gain a definite picture, then the last of my people will be culled. There is no other word for it. So ready or not, cost or not, here I come. I go to prepare. This is going to be bad. Very bad. But it is time to show the steel is not just in the sigil, as Thaddeus says. And so I take to walking, my mind racing, my senses dulled. I take in the ship, as most others must do, 
Its panels and walkways merge into one, distinct but merely descriptions of direction. Pointers to whether I go in the right direction or not. But when I get there, I stop. I linger at the door. I take a deep breath in, then gently touch the pad. The door slides open. The visage before me is bright and welcoming. But my eyes are so complex now. With my normal retina, I can see the colors, the beauty. With my augmented cybernetic eye, I see the speed of action lost on most, the tiny perpetual movements of an Eldar. People believe that they are always still or otherwise in frantic movement, but this is not so. They glide. But nor are they ever truly at rest, their hair, their fingertips dabbling slightly, communicating their intent, their mood, their words and sentiments all in the one. They have no real need of words between them, yet I am not as he. So, we must use them. Words. Alas, it is then that I instinctively shift into my witch sight, my psychovision, and before me is a well of darkness, a pit that eats all laughter and joy from its surroundings, absorbing the light. A broken heart owned by another, one who will shift and twist every now and again just to let him, the solitaire, know that he is still owned. He is beholden. His destiny is her more. A deal with the devil. He is both beautiful and tragic and terrifying to behold. All in the one. I take two paces. One to, one beyond his threshold. The threshold to his room. I instantly feel the pressure on my mind, my brain, my soul, as the glyphs and wards now suppress everything both he and I are. He comes up from his comedically exaggerated and long-held bow. I do not look in his eyes, because I cannot. He wears his mask forever now, unable to hide from us what he is, unable to hide from the enemy any longer. He is a being treading his last path. He goes to die, and he challenges the universe to take this life. He is a solitaire. Thus, he is damned. To what do I owe this honor, Inquisitor Tarquinus? I bow, but halt and look at him in shock. I recover quickly and right myself. Inquisitor Tarquinus. The first time I have ever been addressed thus, and for it to be true. No matter what happens now, I took the oath. I am his mandated servant. I am his hammer. I am his holy inquisitor. I can do this. And thus, I speak to the solitaire. I ask for a boon. Do not use that word, inquisitor. It means more than you know. You mean, in your language, surely, a favor. Nay, I know my mind, and I know my language, and I know what it costs. I ask for a boon. He bows again. Ask. But I guarantee nothing, Inquisitor Tarquinus. I wish to ask you of the enemy. I know you are owned so I know that you are accustomed to its wiles. You, far more than any, even, in my clumsy estimation, the mighty Farseer. His bow comes up. He looks me straight. How do you come to this estimation? Because you were tricked by those same wiles. So you, more than anyone else, you know what they are. You, 
who have lived long, must have walked through your life's path a million times, trying to work out where it all went wrong, where you were put on the path to, your plight. Do not think to pity me, Inquisitor. There is none of that, revulsion if I am honest, which I feel I must be. He counters. Yet you would offer me a boon to call on when I wished. <sighs> Taking the first step on your own way down the same road, perhaps even a more slippery and a swift fall awaits you. Not so. For I give this boon to you, not your master. I condition that you will not be able to ask me for an evil act will not be able to use me for the benefit of your master, will not make me endanger others. The boon, as with this conversation, will be with the mighty son of Eldenesh that I see before me. For your soul is promised to her, but it is still yours. You still command it until the day she has you, and not a day before. And that will be our compact, that I will talk to you as you were, who you are, not what you have become. <laughs> the solitaire could not help his heritage. His harlequin life was more than just dances and death. It was everything. And he dramatically swung back with his torso. Yet, despite how closely they looked to humans when in Picts, their movements were otherworldly. His upper half, his torso, almost seemed to double back as his arms came up in a dramatic defensive posture, then a spin and a whirl of his clothes, and he was now bent down on one knee, his arms spread out wide, his head down. My memories are yours, as is my blade. Understand this, Inquisitor Tarquinus. One day... This blade may be aimed at your throat, for I am a dancer, a tool with more than one master, though you strike closer than any other of your kind, to the heart of it all. No, I can never be trusted. I nodded as the Eldar raised its face to me, as if its neck did not even move. It continued. Then, while we walked the same path, I will be your first. My eyebrows furrowed as I looked quizzically at the solitaire. I know of your ways, Inquisitor. I am old, and I have known Nathadius and others of your ilk for some time now. You have no entourage, so I will be your first. I cannot swear to your cause, but I can swear to you. If you remember my warning, then, if you will have me, I am yours to command. My eyes fluttered in surprise, but I then nodded more sternly, a bargain made. Ask your questions. And so I sat, and we talked truly talked. We talked for hours, and I walked from that room changed. Not so dramatically as some of my other metamorphoses of late, but changed on a different level. My mind had been awoken by Thaddeus. My curiosity, caution, memory, perception, analysis, data recall. My psychopowers powers had erupted into being, then been more fully awoken by her, the sensei. But this, it hardened my heart. The tragedy of it, the simplicity of it. He told me all I wished to know, and what they say is right. They, the Eldar, feel emotions, factors, and intensities more than we do. Yet, Merely watching one of their kind well up and lament, it is like a profound torture. 
to see something so beautiful, then so wretched. To see something racked with such regret, turmoil, misery and pain. To see it all expressed through word, dance and dramatic music. This player performed his own fall, just two and four, me. And to survive this, for the performance was so powerful, I had to harden my heart, or it would have broken. Yet not once did I demur, not once did I switch to my witch sight to clear my empathy. I took it all, I absorbed it. Every sensation, every word, just a sob and moan. Every detail, trick, decision, position that he went through. But it was the simplicity of it. So staggering. And I now know one of the enemy better. The Prince of Pleasure. I know some of his moves, as some might put it. I felt like I had witnessed it all, and I was right there with him. I now understood why Thaddeus does what he does, how he endures the turmoil, how he always sees the bigger picture. It comes from one place. It is a wish to end the cycle, not just do battle with evil, not just thwart its machinations, not just send it back to hell, but to defeat it finally and totally, to destroy it somehow. Because, after what I have heard, seen, felt, I will never forgive those utter. I will never ever drop my guard. Ever. They must be stopped. They must be destroyed. Whew. I head to my quarters. I unlock the door and walk inside. I strip and get into bed, clasping the bolt pistol and combat knife below the sheets as usual. I put my head on the pillow, and I will myself to sleep. After what I have witnessed, knowing full well what I may need to do in the coming days, let alone the coming decades, I will never know another night of clear dreams, of gentle rest again. So I will put my machine, my body, into its rest cycle. I will command my mind to restructure itself, to perform REM cycles. I will sleep the sleep of the just. For now, there can be no rest again. I may sleep, may recharge my body and mind, but my soul will never, ever rest until they are all destroyed. Never. Thaddeus 99, I know what is required of me. I understand now. I need no alarm. As scheduled, after eight full hours, my mind activates. I am aware of my breathing. The sheets are slick with sweat something I expect to reduce in time. Then, perhaps I will need two stiff drinks before reclining, as does Darius. A concern for the future. I must be sharp. I must be inside the moment. I clothe and go to gain sustenance. I stand in queue for first meal, then instantly check myself. Breakfast. It is called breakfast. First meal was the way it was put on my home world, the contact with others from there. It haunts my subconscious, throws up old patterns again. I check myself. Again. Is this old patterns or external influence? But I admit that I was actually thinking of her. Funnily, this time it was not Ursula. She is called Santara, one of the girls I interrogated. Girls. 
I remember now that she is older than me by two harvests. <sighs> years. She is older than me by two years. She had that gentle twang that they have in the south of our continent. Practically local. And she also liked the reeds and drums. It was only just becoming popular with most in the last years before. Well, and I had tried it myself. I liked the uncontrolled energy of it all, but I was not musical. I had no drums, no reeds, and I could not sing. Hence, I just enjoyed it when they were playing. But she had been one of the first in the movement, so she told me, and her body language confirmed it. It was for this reason that she was to accompany the officials off-world, a minor rogue trader dynast. But of course, they did not make it to the ship before. This is weakness. Stop it. Before the skies bled, and the Neverborn flooded the world, and took whomever they wished as host, and slaughtered the rest. There. Done. I said it. Well, no more avoidance. I have daydreamed about her for a few, well, days now. It was puerile. It was wrong. She was under my care. Yet it was effectively harmless. As the old codger said, I hadn't had any shore leave in quite some time. So I fantasized for a few days. Kisses and cuddles, not a full shebang. Yet now, I am driven. I dispelled any thought of her, and I sat and ate my meal, and slowly gathered my mental strength. I saw some of the others in the hall. They witnessed my posture, poise, precision. They knew I was preparing. Well, all but one, perhaps. For Louis waddled over, and I thought that he would pass. But then he carefully placed his tray on my table. He slowly got into the chair across from me, and then straightened said tray and plate, and then just ate. He did not look at me. He did not gesture. He did not interact with me in any way or form. Yet somehow I could tell he was not ignoring me. And we ate together. I could concentrate. I could prepare. But I did not do it alone. When all was consumed, all drunk, we both looked up for the first time, and he just nodded at me, and then got down and waddled away, grinning mischievously, which, of course, was kind of funny, really. Because everyone knew exactly how much this annoyed the Astartes. Barbon would come in later on and go into a seething, quiet rage as he tidied up after the Jacaro. Everyone has their tics, their habits, and cleanliness was Barbon's thing. Well, more to say, order was his thing. So the fruit peels left outside his door, the plates and trays left in the middle of the floor or a table of the canteen. It made him cluck and tut like an old good wife when she could not scold an unruly child. And immediately, I was in higher spirits than I had any right to be. The incorrigible hairy orange weirdo. <laughs> but then I went to work. All preparations had been made by the crew in Devrin, or even by Barbon. The pens had been quiet as the grave after he was summoned to break up a seeming revolt. It was merely chanting and complaining, a bit of shouting. But when Barbon arrived, all fell silent. He drew no sword, shot no bolter. He just ran at them, stopped within a foot of their front rank. But to them, he might as well have teleported there. And they instantly broke and scattered. He had no helm on. He just glared down at them. And all has been quiet since. They even eat in silence. 
I then made sure that there was enough regulator in their meals to prevent agitation. But this had to be stopped for the next round of my inquiry. I needed them sharp, not merely so I could read them, see their minds more coherently, but also because, if they were sedated, then they had less chance of retaining self. They would be less likely to be burned by my moving inside their minds. And so, the very first one was brought in, tied to their chair far more tightly and comprehensively than before. And I did it. I extended my mind into his. There was no concerted effort to resist me. No training, almost no will. He was like an open book. But he was scared, and he was tired. So his mind was an open book whose pages turn in great sways, stopping on an image or memory, thought or feeling, for the briefest of moments, before the pages turned and we moved across his chronology again and I attempted to calm him, to slip deeper into his brain and release some soothing chemicals. But I pushed too far too fast. My mind was like a burning torch amongst the cobweb framework of a near-broken man, and his mental lattice burned. His scheme was scrambled, his sense of self shattered, his screams pierced my ears. Then, I attempted to leave him too swiftly. And his eyes, they burned out. He stank like a grox hit by lightning. His moan ended, as did his movement. I stood and walked to the door. The door to the outside, not to those watching. And I opened it and simply stated to the orderlies, Clear the room, then bring in the next one. I walked to the table and looked at the man, the human I had slain. <sighs> he would get no apology. I then read the manifest to see who would be next. I would not make the same mistakes. I would learn from this. I would make no error twice. But I would not stop. Two days ago, if I had done this, I would have rushed to see Thaddeus. I would look into his eyes and hope to see it, understanding forgiveness. But not any more. I witness the fall of an elder. I am Inquisitor Tarquinus. I am the understudy and chosen successor to the Thaddeus. I will find the truth of the situation, no matter the cost to me, for I am the servant of the Emperor. I am his. Hammer. To be continued.